Well, good morning. All right, it's so good to be able to see you. Like I say, we're in a, a story this morning that can be <clears throat> an incredible uh, inspiration for us because there's a lot of things out there that need to be done, need to be addressed, and there have been for centuries. And most people, <clears throat> most of us just go right on past it. <laughs> but some people make a real difference. And we're talking about a guy who made a real difference. Now, I don't know about you, but has there ever been something you've seen, maybe something at church or something in the community, and you go, man, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, here are all these kids, and, and they, they don't have a home. And, um, or, you know, the, these folks are, are hungry, or that wall needs painting. I mean, it can be a lot of things. And then you go, well, you know, if I, if I step in and try to do something, that's going to it's probably a bigger deal, and it's going to cost more money and more time than, than what I'm really wanting to do. I sure hope somebody else sees this and does something. And we go on. And folks have been doing that for a long, long time. Well, again, this morning we're going to be dealing with somebody who didn't just see something, um, but he actually really made something happen. It's an amazing story of a guy named Nehemiah. Now, for those of you who are new with us or, or just kind of catching, catching up, we've been walking through this story all the way from, from Genesis up to this point, and we've seen how God created this family, started with Abraham, it was the Jewish nation, there were 12 tribes, and then they started battling one another and in rebellion, God said, you keep rebelling, you're going to pay a price. Foreign countries will come in and invade you and take you away. And that's exactly what happened. In the northern ten tribes, uh, the Assyrians came in in 722, hauled them off. Uh, Judah lasted a little bit longer until about uh, 587. The Babylonians came and hauled them all off. So here was this, this promise of God, what we call here the upper story, that I'm going to create a nation, and through this nation, a Messiah is going to come, and there's no nation. There's no people there. No one's in the promised land. And several weeks ago, Donald was preaching through how when the Babylonians were taken over by the Medes and Persians, they had a different way of dealing with people they captured, and rather than hauling them away, they let them go back to their homeland, reestablish their cities and their and their culture, and their worship, and they would allow them to do that as long as they paid tribute or very high taxes back to support. And so the first group goes back, and it's a rough time, <clears throat> and it's very difficult, but God was sovereign. We can trust God is faithful to his word, because he said there's going to be a people, there's going to be a nation, there's going to be a Messiah, and and you might rebel all over the place and miss out on it, but God's going to accomplish this upper purpose. Well, a second group comes back with a guy named Ezra, and he's teaching them God's word, and amazing things start to happen. They rebuild a temple, not near as nice as the first temple that was all torn down, but a second temple. But the walls of the city are still in disrepair. Now, back then, having no walls would be like today, having no army, no navy, no police, no law and order. Anybody could just come in from any time, steal, do whatever they wanted to. It kept a whole region and people basically in bondage to whatever the neighbors and the, and the other um, um, nations around them wanted. And it was a desperate, desperate situation. And it had been that way now for 150 years. Ever since the Babylonians came in, knocked the walls all down, that's where they'd been. And so, we pick the story up in 430, 150 years later, with a man named Nehemiah. So we're in Nehemiah 1, and you can follow along in the story, or in your Bible, or <clears throat> on the screen. Nehemiah 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, I was in the citadel of Susa. Now, those of you who were with us last week, this is where Esther was. This is like the capital of the Medo-Persian 
empire. And Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. Remember those first two groups I told you about that had already gone back, and also about Jerusalem. Now, remember, Nehemiah was born and raised and lived his whole life in a foreign land. He'd never seen Jerusalem, but he'd been told the stories. And he knew this upper story that God wanted to do something with his people in his land. And so he's asking about all of that. Verse 3, and they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And again, these walls had been down for years, 150 years. But he hears the news. And boy, his heart is broken. Now, who was this Nehemiah? Well, you're going down a little bit further and you find out he is the cupbearer of the king. Now, when I was young, I went, a cupbearer. Isn't that like the guy at Ruby Tuesdays who just kind of fills your coffee? And I mean, what's a big deal about a cupbearer? But see, back then, a cupbearer was a big deal because one of the primary ways that you took out kings or assassinate a king was through poisoning. See, this way you could poison the king and you could leave before the guards, you know, cut you in two or, or other nasty things. And so the cupbearer was responsible for everything the king ate and everything the king drank. In fact, he would eat it and taste it first because poisons back then typically, um, archaeologists tell us, had a particular taste. So they're always trying to come up with new ones that tasted a little bit different. And the cupbearer was one of the most trusted leaders and servants of the king. The king put his life in the cupbearer's hands every single day. And the cupbearer was willing to put his life on the line every single day. You just didn't put anybody in as a cupbearer. I mean, honestly, how many people would you trust with your very life every single day that if they didn't do their job, it could be the end of your life? That's the kind of trusted person he was. And by the way, we find that faithful Jews throughout the centuries and wherever God places them, many rose to positions of great power and influence because of the God they served and their integrity and, every, and everything else. So, he hears this news of the broken down walls. 150 years this has happened. I mean, you think back in our nation. What happened 150 years ago that we even know what happened, much less give a rip about <laughs> or concerned about? But he was. There are a lot of different people in our world, and they see different things in different ways. There are a lot of people who they look, and they don't even see a problem. They, they, don't, they don't see the issue. Other people see it, but they don't feel anything. There's a broken wall, so what? That's just the way it's always been. My grandfather was broken wall. His grandfather, broken wall. Other people might see something and feel deeply. They see that child that's hungry. They see that guy on the street. They see the room that's a mess, whatever it is, and they go... Man, I just, I really feel bad about that. But not bad enough to do anything. Just, I, I hope somebody else will do it. And others are like Nehemiah. You see, the first step in making a difference for God is to open our eyes and to allow God to change our heart. Now, this morning, um, in your notes there, if, if you want to write anything down, Put this down, circle it, whatever. This summarizes the whole thing. Get a burden from God. Get a burden from God. And then do something. And then do something. Don't just get a burden and, oh, this is terrible. Get a burden from God and do something. And when God leads, you got to make things 
happen. Now, the point of the story, when you, when you go through the scriptures and you read through the whole thing of Nehemiah, why is it in here? What was the author trying to say? The main point of the book of Nehemiah is this upper story that God is faithful to his word, he is faithful to his people, and when he said there will be a nation and they will be there in that place, and from them, from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of King David, there will come a Messiah who will take care of the sins of all the world. Nehemiah is a reminder that God is going to work his upper story. That's why it's there. But when we come down from the upper story to the lower story where we live, we can see how did he use and why did he use this one guy, Nehemiah, when there had been hundreds and thousands of others that had gone by, seen the same walls, been in positions of leadership, and did absolutely nothing. We can learn a whole, whole lot. Get a burden from God and then do something. And you notice the first thing he did? He didn't start coming up with plans. He didn't start saying, okay, here are all my options. The first thing he did is he prayed. He broke down in prayer. He got before God. And it was difficult. And he literally wept. Let me ask you, when's the last time you've been so broken over something or someone that you actually wept? Can you even think of the last time? Not weeping for you, but weeping for somebody else. Not just feeling sorry. Years ago, someone asked me that question, and my first thought as a response is, I mean, here's an immature guy. I go, me? (laughs) I don't cry about anything. And he looked at me and he said, that's too bad. God's not breaking your heart. Because God's heart's broken about things. Why isn't yours? Well, then I wasn't quite so macho. <laughs> Going, okay, this is bad. I haven't wept over, I don't, I don't weep over anything. And so I prayed a prayer that honestly, times I wish I hadn't. I said, God, please break my heart for what breaks yours. Give me a tender heart. And God answered my prayer. And so now I feel like an idiot sometimes when we're walking through a patch of the scripture or we see a video or something happens in somebody's life and, and it's just like kids and whatever and, 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 and I choke up. And, and honestly, still, I get, it's just pure pride. It makes me mad. I don't want to be that guy weeping over something or somebody, but we really get the heart of God. There are going to be times you're going to feel the pain of other people. <laughs> I heard a guy one time, he was walking through this with a friend, and the guy goes, whoa, whoa, I thought I was supposed to be blessed as a child of God. I thought I was supposed to be happy all the time. Isn't that what Christians are supposed to be? Just put a smile on your face and be happy all the time? He says, I come to church to feel good. Really? I mean, I, I hope you enjoy the incredible worship that Nick and the group did this morning, and I hope you... But, guys, our job here is not to make you feel good. Nowhere does it say, go and make people feel good. It says, go and make disciples. Jesus was called a man of what? Anybody know? A man of sorrows. And he was living in the fullness of God more than anybody else. If Jesus is a man of sorrows, there ought to be some sorrow in our life as well. You see, guys, we live in a fallen world, and sin and evil are destroying lives all around us, and it ought to bother you. It ought to tear you up. There ought to be something that you see of of tens of thousands of people that live all around us just kind of going through life not having a relationship with the living God of the universe who died on the cross for them. And if that doesn't stir something inside of you, then then something's broken. Guys, 
This is why God has put us in the world. Listen, if all he wants to do is for you to give him glory and for you to worship him, then he could just kill you now and take you to heaven. You'll do a lot better job of that up there. The reason you're here in the world is to make a difference. It's to get in on this incredible upper story and plan that God is doing and wanting to redeem mankind because this story's not done until Jesus comes again. And we're going to get to that in a few weeks, by the way, where the, these um, the scriptures promise that. So this morning, the first thing I want to ask is, would you be willing to join me and pray and say, God, break my heart for what breaks yours? Break my heart, God, for what breaks yours. And use me in this world somehow. So Nehemiah had this great burden for Jerusalem and her people and the wall. And again, the first thing he did is he prayed. In fact, the whole last part of the, the book of, uh, I mean, chapter one, is his pouring out his prayer. And we don't have time to go through all that, but I've taught you guys the acronym ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, ACTS. And you see him go through that. He adores and honors God. He confesses his sin and the sin of the people of, of, of Israel, all the Jews of saying, God, we did not follow you. And then he thanked God for his faithfulness and he prayed, God, give me a plan and give me honor and, and a position and favor with the king. So when God gives you a burden, you don't just run off and start doing something. The first thing you do is get before God in prayer. Making a difference starts with prayer. Making a difference starts with prayer. Not just jumping in and fixing and doing something. So, Nehemiah 2. <clears throat> now, by the way, this is four months later. He spent four months in prayer and then planning and coming up with, with what he's going to do. So in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. And I had not been sad in his presence before. Let me just pause. You were not to be sad in the presence of the king. The king wanted happy people. There was enough bad around, so you put a smile on your face regardless. You know, I always wish I could make that, that command with all my kids in my household. It didn't work, but... When you could take their head off, it did. You know? So he had never been sad around the king. Everybody's always happy. You know, um, what, what, a, what a world to live in. So the king asked me, but this time he's intentionally now going in, being noticeably disturbed, sad. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid see this is a good way that you lose your job or you lose your head you lose your position you know it's not good when the cupbearer looks sick remember his whole job <laughs> keep the king from getting this so what what's going on here are you doing your job and there ought to be sometimes when you're stepping out in faith so much that you're afraid because if god doesn't come through you're going to be in trouble I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, Oh, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. You ever done that? Well, Lord, help me. By, and then you're talking. This ought to be an instantaneous, continual sort of thing. You're praying, you're staying tuned with God, and you're stepping out in faith and doing what he wants you to do. And then I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so I can rebuild it. You notice he didn't go, the king asked him, so what do you want? Yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly sure. This kind of all hit me just last night, but give me a little time to think about it. And no, no, no. He was ready. He was ready when the time was right. So when the king asked, he knew exactly his request. 
And he was a man of, again, power and position that could request that. And again, he's afraid. God, help me. Let me ask you, when's the last time you've, you're stepping out of faith, you're trusting God so much for something that, that you were afraid? God's calling you to leave one job and go to another. God's calling you to reach out to a family member or somebody that you had a broken relationship for a long time. Or he's calling you to share your faith. Or kids, he's calling you to reach out to the kid everybody else thinks is a dork and a weirdo. And you know if you associate with them or what they're going to think about you. And yet you know that's what God wants you to do. When's the last time you've been stepping out in faith so much you're afraid? So many of us as Christians have tried our whole lives to be safe and comfortable. We've forgotten what it is to, to trust God. You know, you'll never read in the scripture where Jesus says, take up your cross and be comfortable. Never. I just want you to be safe and comfortable and warm. And I mean, there's whole books out there. Your best life now. Hey, I mean, this is just make it all nice and easy. The problem is, guys, that's not found in Scripture. God has not, you heard me say this last week, God has not called you to be safe. He's called you to be faithful. So let's get a burden from God, and then let's do something. Let's be willing to take a, a risk. So he's not just waiting and doing nothing for these four months. While he's waiting on God's timing, he's praying. We know that. He's fasting. He's getting a vision. He's getting a plan. He's pulling together a strategy, and he's ready to launch it when God opens the door. And God opens the door. Verse 6. And then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? I.e., you're a trusted servant and I don't want you to be gone too long. I want you back here. That, by the way, says a whole lot about Nehemiah. And it, it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. We don't know what that time was, but he didn't just come off of this off the top of his head. He thought it through. This is how long it's going to take me to get there. It takes a couple of months to travel that far, and then to pull all the materials, and then build the wall, and set up. He's basically being sent as a governor. And this is what it was going to take to get everything set up, and this is when I can, when I can come back. And then, then he didn't stop there. I also said to him, now obviously, guys, he's working a plan here. If it pleases the king... May I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct because he had to go through that region to get down to Jerusalem. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. So he planned on going there for a while. And because of the gracious hand of my, my God was on me, the king granted my request so basically said a, a king not only do i want to leave and not serve you here i'm going to go back there and tackle this whole project would you let me go and by the way would you finance the whole thing that's a bold ask and there are going to be some times in your life you need to go to someone and make a bold ask and say well they're not a believer they're still in the hands of god amen so make a bold ask. Sometimes you're going to need to go to a son or a daughter when they're an adult and, and make a bold ask. Sometimes you need to go to your spouse and make a bold ask. I, this is what I need to make this happen. The scriptures never says, get a vision from God and then think you're going to do it all on your own. We need help and we need one another. That's part of what the whole body of Christ is supposed to be, is coming alongside and helping one another. So verse 9, so I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. And the king also sent an arm, army officers and a cavalry with me. That's the way to show up in a new town. <laughs> Let them know I've arrived. When the time was right, he was ready. Do you see that? He didn't come up with this all right there when the king asked. He, he thought it through. 
He thought through the de details. Now, we're all different personalities. There's some of you here, you're big picture, you're vision kind of people. You see the, the big thing, details aren't, aren't your cup of tea so much, but, but you kind of see the big picture. I'm curious, how many of you are sort of big picture people? Let me see your hand. How many of you are kind of big picture people? All right, great. Now, some of you are the detail kind of folks. Somebody comes up with an idea and you go, that's great. And how are we going to pay for that? And when is that going to start? And, and how are we going to be able to pull this together? And, you know, you see the details in some of this. How is it going to actually happen? How many of you are more detail kind of folks? All right. Now, which ones do we need in this church? we got to have both. Because <laughs> if all you have is detail, folks, then all the details are covered. You're just not going anywhere. <laughs> You're not going to do anything. But if all you have is big picture people, oh, yeah, some of you are going, yeah, you're in a big mess. <laughs> and you're right. Now, I'll tell you, I am more of a big picture person, a, a vision of seeing things where we can be. Uh, guys, I already see us two years down the road, not in one service, but in two services or in three services. And I see different ways and a vision of being able to reach this community around us. Now, all the details of how we're going to get there, I don't know yet. I'm still praying about it. <laughs> but there's some things even up close. For example, one of the things that, that I've been praying about, and several of us said, all right, how do we begin to reach this community? How do we get into the community? And then one day it hit me, somebody came and said, well, you know, Bob, now I hadn't been here in the spring before. But they said, right out on our front yard, we have this thing called upward soccer. And we have hundreds of families every week show up right here i said wow that's amazing i'm curious how many of you have been out here on a saturday for upward soccer of watching anybody play how many of y'all have been out here all right that's no and i said well, great what have we done they said well we hadn't done anything we just kind of let them use the yard oh we got to do better than that so I want to pull together a team. I thought, well, okay, we can do some things. We can at least go out and, and welcome folks individually, welcome the teams when they come, hand them some cold water. I need some folks that will come alongside me and go, that's a great idea, Bob. Where are we going to get the water? How are you going to get it cold? How many people are we going to need? How are you going to get it from this to this to that? And yet, you know, so if you have a heart and passion for reaching this community and just caring about those folks, and you'd be willing to be a part of, a, of an outreach team for me, especially if you're one of those that have been here on a Saturday and you've seen all the parents and you've seen all the kids and you, you've been able to see things that I haven't seen yet, I could really use your help. And that little tear-off that's in, that's in the uh, program there, put your name and say, Bob, I'd be, I'd be willing to at least talk to you about helping reach this Reach this community, letting them know that we actually care about them and they're, we're glad that they're, they're here. Nehemiah continues, though. Nehemiah 2.10. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, that, that Nehemiah had come and there's all these, these uh, new governor and all this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Why? Well, they were ruling the, the neighboring regions. They didn't want a strong Jewish center. They didn't want a strong city. The weaker it was, the better it was for them. Do you think everybody's going to like your vision? Do you think everybody's going to like your idea and your plan? Absolutely not. I'm amazed at how many Christians say, well, I think what you ought to do, and then somebody opposes it, and they go, well, I, I guess expect opposition there's a reason there's a mess there's somebody who likes it that way so expect opposition internal opposition external opposition and remember folks our goal is not to have everybody like us our goal is to accomplish what god has laid on our hearts so verse 11 i went to jerusalem and after staying there three days, now he's traveled several months, he's got these letters, but he's just showed up. Basically, I'm the new governor, and I got some soldiers and others that declare it. I've got letters from the king. 
And anytime you got a new boss, a new governor coming in, everybody's kind of wondering, well, what, what's this going to mean and do? Verse 12. Well, after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. And there were no mounts or horses with me except the one I was riding on. And by night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had not said, any, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or the officials or any of the others who would be doing the work. Now, remember I said, get a burden from God and do something. Because we got to be smart about it. we got to be wise. we got to understand where people are, how to do that. So somebody tell me, what in the world is he doing? Why is he going out at night with just a small group? What's he doing? He's surveying the problem. He just didn't show up and go, we're going to rebuild the walls. And they're all going, have you seen the walls? <laughs> Do you know what kind of a mess we're in? Do you know they've been this way for 150 years and in a changing? He did his homework. And I was, Guys, when God places a burden on your heart, before you go out telling everybody all this grand stuff you're going to do, do your homework. Look, get the lay of the land. Find out why that wall was where it is and get into mind what it's going to take to rebuild it. And that's exactly what he did before he told anybody. And remember, he did have a few other folks with him. Run it past a few trusted leaders. Thank goodness he didn't have Facebook and, and social media tell everybody what he was eating every night and where he was going. Because nobody cares, but that's a whole other uh, issue here. All right. Verse 17. And then I said to them, so this is the next day, you see the trouble that we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. And I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. <clears throat> and they saw the timber and, and the, the, the letters that were going to be able to provide this. And so they replied, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. Now guys, they'd already tried this a few times. Other folks had seen this same burden. And every time, opposition knocked it down. It was hard work. And Nehemiah had to be strong. He had to be wise. There were times when they had to, I mean, this is an amazing story. For those of you who got to read through it this week, you know, they had to be, sometimes they were, they were literally placing the, the, the rocks on the wall with one hand and holding a sword in the other. You're going to hit hard times. You're going to hit opposition. It's not going to be easy. But they got it done. But you know, they worked all together hard in 52 days the wall was built now i want you to think about it it'd been broken down for 150 years <laughs> and it took one leader with a burdened heart for god who decided he was going to do something and he stepped in and he made it happen please this morning get a burden from God and do something. I meet Christians all the time that have been sitting in church for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and have done nothing for the cause of God. That is not his plan. How sad. How sad. 
It's going to take faith. It's going to take courage. It's going to take discernment. It's going to take planning. It's going to come building a team. It's going to take overcoming opposition, but it will be worth it. As a church body, I want us to try something so big it scares us because without God, it'll fail. So let's do that as a church. And some of you have been coming every week, and I'm so grateful and thankful you're coming every week. But for some of you, it's time to step up and say, I'm going to do something now. I'm not going to be just somebody who comes and sits and listens and says, wow, that was great, and goes home and comes back the next week. But guys, we can use the same analogy of broken walls in our own lives as well. Is there some broken wall in your life? Something that, that you know God wants built up and strong and it's kind of falling apart in your life and maybe you've tried to do it and tried to fix it, but you're still afraid? First, again, you've got to have a real burden for the Lord and then you've got to spend some time with Him. And then you've got to know that God has called you to live in fullness of Him. Ask His guidance. Come up with a plan. Make a difference. And yeah, like Nehemiah, you're going to need some help. So there may be somebody here this morning, you know the broken wall in your life is you're, you're way more addicted to alcohol or drugs than, than you want to be. You're functioning, but you're not accomplishing near what you need to. Get in a group like Celebrate Recovery. Let some folks come around to help you. Maybe your finances are in shambles. You're in debt up to your eyeballs. Every month it's an argument of how are we going to pay and this and that. Get some help. we got a whole course here led by Dave Ramsey on Wednesday nights. Maybe your marriage has got some real places in the walls that aren't good. Oh, no, no, no. Our marriage is perfect. We never disagree. Oh, yeah, and what planet are you living on? And if there's a broken place in your marriage, then let somebody know. We can provide some help. There's some counselors we have. and Do something. I, I plead with you this morning to step out in faith and trust God and take a risk and start rebuilding the broken walls of your life. And it's not going to happen overnight. And I don't care if they've been broken 150 years. In the power of God, they can be made new. Maybe this morning you know of somebody whose life is falling apart. I do. I've got several close friends and others that were walking with God, and they're not walking with God anymore. And it breaks my heart. You know, I, I, this morning I'm going to just open up the altar for you to be able to come and pray. Maybe it's to come and pray for somebody else who the walls of their life is really falling down and you want to pray for them maybe you want to come and pray for yourself your life your marriage your whatever maybe you want to join me down front and just pray for our church that we'll get a vision a burden from god and that we'll be burdened enough to do something about it because, guys, God is faithful. God is faithful to his plan. God is going to bring redemption. The question is, are we going to get in on this upper story? Are we going to allow him to use us? Because when we do, this life gets more exciting than you can possibly imagine. And one day when you look Jesus eye to eye, he can look at you and say, well done, Good and faithful servant, you accomplish the task I sent you to do. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every person here this morning. And Lord, I pray first of all for our church. God, that we will see the world around us. And God, that you will give us a burden. You've said the fields are wide unto harvest. There's folks all around us who need this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's everything of how they can not only live this life, but live in eternity with you. 
Lord, give us your burden. And Lord, give us the strength and the courage to take a risk and to do something. Yes, in your strength. Yes, in your power. Yes, as you lead. But God, we want to do something. Lord, I pray for those here who their own lives are falling apart. There's an area that, that's just taken over. And their self-control and their discipline there is just not what it needs to be. And I pray today will be a day. They'll step up, take a risk, ask for help. And together, begin to change their life. And Lord, for so many of us here who have good friends or, or family members or aunts or uncles or parents or children who are not walking with you, their walls are falling apart. God, please do a work. We lay our, our lives and ourselves before you. Give us your burden, God. And in your strength, we're going to do something. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand with me? In this time of invitation, this is the time just for you to do business with God. Whether it's praying for our church, praying for yourself, praying for a friend, I invite you.